Hello? Is this thing on? Hello, hello. Hello! Oh, welcome, welcome to the first ever episode of Cult Queen. The only pop culture history show brought to you by a bearded drag queen. That's me! That's me! That's me! I got some shit I don't want to tell you about, so Sam, shut the fuck up! It's time to look inside the magic trash can and see what we're gonna talk about today! Mm. Oh, oh, Hello? No, I'll call you back, Mom. Oh, oh whoa. Today's episode is called Damaged Goods. It's about the birth of the exploitation film circuit in the early 20th century. And ooh, it looks rancid. Let's break this motherfucker open and see what crawls out. This is age of Hollywood. It was a grand era, full of great stars, epic stories, and syphilis? Oh, that's nasty. Let me take you back to a simpler time. No, actually, let me take you back to the sweaty ass crack of a simpler time. In the first half of the 20th century, while the Hollywood studio system was busy cranking out safe, audience-friendly entertainment according to a strict internal code of conduct, a shadow film industry was flagrantly upending that code of conduct, exploring and exploiting all the twisted taboos and bizarre subjects where mainstream movies were not allowed to go. This charmingly sleazy underworld was known as the exploitation film circuit, and syphilis is how it all began. This is the strange story of how the progressive movement of the early 20th century, who gave us women's suffrage, child labor laws, and prohibition, also accidentally gave us the exploitation film circuit by giving birth to the original Moral Panic Message movie. We'll explore how one of the first socially-minded movies with a message spawned a wave of copycats, eventually splitting the young film industry in two and then mutating into its own disreputable, rotted genre, what we lovingly remember as exploitation film. I love trash. But before I tell you that story, let's talk about what exactly is an exploitation film. You may have heard of some of the most famous ones, like perennial bad movie classic Reefer Madness, but that is just the tip of the garbage iceberg. There are many, many types of films that fall into this particular dumpster, but what I'm focusing on is the oranges of the golden age of exploitation films, which mirrored the rise and fall of Hollywood's golden age from the teens to the 50s. While mainstream movies were produced by major studios and released concurrently across the country in first-run, studio-owned theaters, then withdrawn after a few weeks, exploitation movies were made independently and traveled around the country on a roadshow circuit booked into, let's say, less than A-list venues, sometimes for years, often being re-edited, retitled, and recycled so their producers could turn a fast buck and keep it pumping. Hello, I like money. To compensate for this lack of prestige and keep putting asses in the seats, exploitation films used shock value and a carnival-like atmosphere to thrill their audiences, not only with films delving into taboo, banned subjects, but also by employing various tacky gimmicks, such as having lectures from supposed medical professionals, giving out pamphlets and featuring elaborate displays and exhibits in the lobbies. The shocking content they featured often seems absurdly tame by today's standards, but back then caused no end of controversy, and screenings were frequently shut down by police using obscenity laws. Shut up, you're going to jail where normal, respectable films of the day refused to go, the exploitation film racket was there to titillate the void and make many a buck doing it. Debauchery, violence, murder, suicide. 
how did they get away with it? By slathering on a thin veneer of moralism and education, that's how. By loudly, obnoxiously virtue signaling and proclaiming their self-importance, these films were able to show thirsty audiences back in the good old days all kinds of lurid, taboo content they could not find in a mainstream studio film. That's vulgar. Don't talk to me. Much to the perpetual frustration and embarrassment of those studios. These films were bold, honest exposés, traveling across the country to enlighten humanity and abolish ignorance by shouting from the rooftops the menaces of the modern world to save your children! Actually, they were just there to show sex, drugs, and violence, but it's not like they could just say that. It's the smart peddler. <laughs> from drugs to nudism to vice rings to burlesque shows, it was a wonderful world of weird, low-budget trash movies made by a colorful lot of shrewd producers and former carnies, shipped around the country and played in questionable venues for audiences who needed a cheap thrill. Again! Now, let's talk about what exploitation film was not. Hardcore pornography. Not this time. You're wrong. Oh, oh, sorry, that was hardcore pornography. Excuse me. <laughs> Those kinds of movies couldn't be shown in any public theater of the time. Before the sexual revolution of the 60s made porn fashionable, it was strictly a bar, backroom, Kiwanis Club basement, underground affair, and anyone found to possess it faced possible arrest and prosecution under obscenity laws. Although dirty movies probably became a booming underground business about five minutes after the camera was invented, and for a while in the 1970s it was America's favorite pastime, the legality of porn and whether it was protected by the First Amendment was always in question all the way until the 1988 U.S. Supreme Court decision in The People vs. Freeman officially declared it protected free speech. Anyway, the point is, while some exploitation movies got as close as legally possible, looking at you, nudist films, they were not porn. Did you catch that, loud and clear? These films are educational. They do not, I repeat, totally do not exist just to show you drugs and titties. Sure, Jan. But even riding that fine line of obscenity between art and porn, the producers still frequently faced rough legal waters. Don't swim in the sea! Depending on where they were booking their movies. To that end, they often employed what was known as a square-up reel, an extra section of the film that could easily be slipped in and out by the theater projectionist, containing more spicy, risque content, and only to be used when they thought they could get away with it. But, to avoid the dreaded obscenity label and a lot of possible legal problems, exploitation films, on the surface, had to be fueled by whatever moral panic had most recently gripped doctors, law enforcement, and various church ladies' leagues. Won't somebody please think of the children? And were controversial, but generally legal to show and claimed to be well-intentioned. Of course, any pretense of performing a goodwill for the public was mostly bullshit. And after the first few waves of films, that was pretty obvious to most of their audiences. But how, you ask, did we get there? What was the original spark that set off this gigantic, stinky tire fire of a movie genre? Let's go way, way back to the progressive era and the earliest days of film to find out how the first wave of sex education eventually ended in lawsuits, banning, and grown men fainting in the aisles of theaters. You're all going to hell. Goodbye. <laughs> Exploitation films are generally regarded as ethically dubious, industrially marginal, and aesthetically bankrupt. Mama, this is garbage. Oh. Right here. But surprisingly, they didn't start out that way. Exploitation film actually began as a sincere effort by the progressive movement to institute sex education for the masses. The story of sex education films, and eventually the exploitation racket, begins in the early 20th century as rapid developments in technology and medicine had begun to carry us into a new era, but we were still trapped by the extremely repressed religious anti-sexual paranoias of the Victorian age. This shame and repression had made treating the then rampant problem of sexually transmitted diseases all but impossible, ruining untold lives and reputations. Up to that point, it was considered less shameful to have a venereal disease in private than to discuss it publicly. 
Myths and pseudoscience promoted painful, ineffective treatments, and sex education as we know it was non-existent. In 1909, as Paul Ehrlich was developing the first viable treatment for syphilis, the progressive movement was using old-fashioned Protestant moralism combined with the science of the day to combat the ills of the modern industrial world, and was intent on making sex education a matter of public safety instead of a shameful secret. Chlamydia! Herpes! Gone real! Soon, their efforts inspired the first play to ever directly take on the subject. In 1913, Eugene Brio's Damaged Goods was staged in New York City with the endorsement of a respected medical journal and broke taboos by speaking the word syphilis on stage for the first time. It was endorsed by the New York Times and many in high society, and a special performance was arranged for President Woodrow Wilson in Washington. Inevitably, it wasn't even a year before Damaged Goods was adapted by the burgeoning film industry, with its original star, Richard Bennett, by the American Film Manufacturing Company and released by Mutual Film. Industry trade magazines fell all over themselves to promote it as an educational godsend, and the film was an unprecedented smash hit, bringing in a metric sh ton of cash and making damaged goods the patient zero of a new film genre, spawning a wave of other moral panic movies fighting to recapture that same self-important moralizing spark. The plot of Damaged Goods, based only on surviving articles and reviews as the film has been entirely lost, tells the story of a fine young professional from an excellent home set to marry a prominent society belle. The young man foolishly enjoys a drunken night out that includes an encounter with a prostitute who infects him with the dreaded syphilis. He then marries, passing it on to his new wife, an unborn child who dies in infancy. Sad. While the importance of this film in opening up public consciousness about sexual education cannot be overstated, Damaged Goods and the progressive movement itself were more anti-sex and anti-prostitute than pro-birth control, and unfortunately still mired in puritanical abstinence-only beliefs about sex. What if I want to have sex before I get married? Well, I guess you just have to be prepared to die. And loudly espoused the bullshit, classist belief of the day that venereal disease was a poor person problem inflicted on the bourgeois by immigrants and the working class. Isn't that cute? But it's wrong! So, how successful was Damaged Goods? A 1915 article in the Moving Picture World described a four-week run in Detroit as sold out and filled to its 650-seat capacity at every showing, averaging 5,000 people a day. The crowd was so large in the evening that three policemen were assigned to the theater to keep the crowd in line and from blocking the street. While we don't have actual box office totals, we do know that it was produced for less than $50,000, but the rights to show it distributed for $600,000 per state, indicating a box office haul of around $2 million. Adjusted for inflation today, that's making $52 million on a $13 million budget for the distribution rights alone. Holy s***! Thanks to Eugene Brio, the morbid curiosity of moviegoers was firmly established, and sex hygiene was now officially a hot topic. I gotta have more! I gotta have more! Starting in 1915, a wave of damaged goods imitations appeared on screens, burning up the box office and tickling the progressive movement's collective cooters in the name of educating the public by telling them stories about poor people ruining their French vanilla fantasy with dirty sex problems. <laughs> Always with the same hyper-moralistic progressive tone and nearly identical plots. The trend continued until the end of World War I, with 1919 seeing eight new sex hygiene films and the second re-release of Damaged Goods. The spreading evil received the enthusiastic support of the Secretary of the Navy and was praised by the moving picture world for being frank in its subject matter, but acceptably delicate in its handling of it. Following that, a film called The Scarlet Trail, that was praised for its delicate handling of racy subject matter and its absence of salacious scenes, became the last sex hygiene film to be received in such a positive manner, before a notorious film made by the U.S. government shit the bed and changed everything. Uh-oh. No, no! Wait a minute! But we'll get to that in just a minute. Up to 1919, though, most of the dust kicked up in regards to these movies were attributable to the old conspiracy of silence and old-fashioned attitudes still hanging around, but not to the way the subject was handled or any offensive scenes. In fact, 
The first wave of VD films were subject to little or no censorship at all. Why would they be, when they espoused morality and abstinence as a middle and upper class defense against threats posed by the lower classes? Moreover, this first group of films were made by the mainstream film studios of the day and championed by the so-called moral watchdogs as a call to action to preserve traditional values, so they were readily accepted by the public and authorities alike. So how the f did we go from sex hygiene films being the savior of Christian morality to being instantly canceled, roasted, toasted, and buried in a trash bag in the backyard? Groba! Bye, get out, get out. The sudden and sharp backlash stemmed entirely from two military training films produced by the US government during World War I, and then released to the public after the war was over. Fit to Fight, later re-edited and re-released as Fit to Win, and The End of the Road detailed the sexual adventures of army cadets and their female counterparts at home, and were the first films to show actual footage of the ravages of venereal disease in real motherfucking graphic detail. <laughs> These films were originally intended only for soldiers and military personnel, but after the war ended, they were put in wide release by an outside company called Public Health Films as part of the continuing progressive efforts to educate the public. But after the gentle, safe moralism of the previous wave of films, this sudden documentarian expose of this subject matter was apparently too f***ing much, and an epic shit fit by religious leaders and authority figures ensued across the country. To combat this preemptively, theaters omitted minors under 16 and separated showings by gender, a standard that once established remained a practice of exploitation films forever afterwards. Even that, however, did not mitigate the controversy, with one review speculating that Fit to Fight may have to be shown in the city dump. Despite being huge hits with the public and raking in fistfuls of cash, the films were banned or censored by many states, the subject of a legal battle in New York City when the license commissioner threatened to pull any theater's license that showed fit to win to the public, and, according to this newspaper clipping, caused a man named Earl Smith to pass out on the floor of the theater and be taken to a homeopathic hospital. That's so upsetting. But besides the newly graphic extremes of the Fit 2 series, there was perhaps another underlying ugly reason for their rejection by certain critics and public officials. The Army had produced the series with the intention to create unity among all soldiers during wartime. Unity! And thus featured the equalization of multiracial characters from differing economic backgrounds, and the rejection of the old-fashioned morality play format. So, for the first time, sex hygiene films weren't racist, hypermoral church plays using every opportunity to sh on poor people, and, further enraging a section of religious f nuts, they did not advocate abstinence as the only solution to venereal disease, and actually educated people on the use of prophylactics. Condoms, Rose! Condoms! Condoms! And on top of that, they were completely disgusting! However, when the war ended and the class and race barriers were put back into place, this equality was deemed no longer acceptable on movie screens. <laughs> Damn son of a bitch. And just like that, the mainstream sex hygiene picture was out. You need to leave. But it was too late. Money had been made. A formula had been discovered. The dirty syphilitic sex genie was out of the bottle. Ah, after 10,000 years, I'm free. And would never entirely go back in. While Fit to Fight, Fit to Win, and The End of the Road were being lambasted by polite society, but still eaten up by gross, thirsty audiences who made it clear they really wanted to see rotten wieners and pussies on the big screen, the film industry was in a state of transition. At the start of the 1920s, after a series of early scandals and bad press, the major powers in Hollywood were beginning a push from the top down to grow up the young, unruly American movie business into a centralized, autonomous industry, to hold legitimacy in the eyes of the public, get the looming threat of government censorship off their backs, and most importantly, save their profit margins from scissor-wielding authority figures in the projection booth. Back in the early days of film, every state had its own regulatory body for censorship, and films were subject to the moral whims of whatever area they were playing in, and would be mercilessly chopped, sliced, and diced to remove any perceived Disgusting. content often resulting in films that would play totally differently from state to state. 
Not only that, the cuts would often make a hash of the plot and outright ruin the movie, and thus the box office take for the studio. Seeking to mitigate this problem and keep the government out of its business, as the Supreme Court had somehow ruled in 1915 that motion pictures did not have First Amendment protection, the studios started to self-regulate. They instituted their own list of rules, first called the 13 points, later called the don'ts and be carefuls, to control and homogenize the content to suit any taste and temperament. And in 1922, they hired former Postmaster General, Presbyterian Elder, and Human Mayonnaise Sandwich, Will Hayes, <laughs> to help rehabilitate Hollywood's rapidly deteriorating image. These changes didn't happen overnight, and the Hayes Code wasn't even fully enforced until 1934, but it was clear that the wind had shifted, and blatantly salacious content, even with a thin veneer of public service, would no longer be tolerated in mainstream films. By the end of the decade, studios who embraced this homogenization were becoming the powerful, omnipresent corporate entities we recognize today, and the ones who refused it were rejected, and in response created the original independent film industry, still rooted in the methods of production and distribution the mainstream had just left behind, and independent of almost any oversight. Whatever, I do what I want. In the decades to come, while the mainstreamers cleaned up their act to facilitate higher profit margins and less outside control, the underdwellers, such as notable purveyors of trash Dwayne Esper and Kroger Bab, would sex and shock up their movies on the roadshow circuit with a thin veneer of moralism using ripped-from-the-headline stories to titillate sex-starved audiences in theaters frequently on the wrong side of the tracks, spawning many different types of films, each offshoot genre becoming its own trashy, fascinating rabbit hole. And what became of actual, honest-to-God, helpful sex education films? Well, that would have to wait until World War II, when the U.S. government had finally lived down the embarrassment of the Fit 2 series and began producing educational, attitude-building films. After the war, the mantle was taken up by outside companies, such as Coronet and Centron, and covered a wide range of subjects, like social etiquette, personal hygiene, civic responsibility, and finally, a balanced, reasonable take on sexual education. Datedly conservative and largely out of touch by today's standards, but far from the Protestant moral panicking of damaged goods. And thus we had, for roughly 40 years, two contentious, codependent sides of the movies, one in the light and one in the dark. This symbiotic dichotomy continued until the late 1950s, when the mainstream studio system, fighting for attention with the hot new invention of television, ran out of juice and collapsed. And with no antagonist to subvert, and no void left to fill with smut, the classic exploitation system disappeared along with the studio system, followed soon by the free-for-all of the 1960s and 70s, the normalization of hardcore porn, SEX CAULDRON! I THOUGHT THEY CLOSED THAT PLACE DOWN! and the inception of the modern MPAA rating system. But although the format and venues that gave life to exploitation have died, the children of its hysterical moral panicking live on. In every Lifetime movie, after-school special, ripped from the headlines, the coming for you, Barbara, piece of shit scare media ever made. I'm so excited! I'm so scared! From Just Say No, to Stranger Danger, to The Truth Initiative, every time you've rolled your eyes at a histrionic PSA, you have damaged goods, the progressive movement, and syphilis to thank for it. Well, maybe one puff won't hurt me. Sure, you know I wouldn't steer you wrong. Stop it. Get some help. And that, my friends, is the weird, kinda gross origin story of the exploitation film circuit. This episode was based on the book Bold, Shocking, Daring, True, A History of Exploitation Films, 1919-1959, by Eric Schaefer, it is a lengthy, fascinating deep dive into this subject, and of course goes into far more detail and nuance than this YouTube video by a drag queen ever could. Hopefully I've hit the basics as best I can, but after that... Son, you're on your own. If you want to watch any of the surviving films referenced here, visit the Internet Archive at archive.org, the world's largest collection of public domain media. It's an invaluable resource and has been an endless source of entertainment and free material for me for many years. If you enjoyed this video, you'll absolutely love the Internet Archive. 
And while you're at it, make a small donation to help keep them going. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and hopefully I'll be back with another one soon. This one took about eight months, though, so it might be a while. Do you have any suggestions for future shows? If there's a weird little dark alley in pop culture you'd like to see me take a trip down, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. I'm a raging narcissist. In the meantime, you can follow my adventures making art and doing drag on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and buy some of my merch on Spreadshirt. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon, you nasty motherfuckers. You're all going to hell. Goodbye. <laughs>